welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we're going to be reconvening with Laird Barron for part two of our conversation. If you want to hear part one, then all you need to do is head back just one episode to episode 188. In that conversation, we speak with Laird about growing up in Alaska, applying life lessons to writing, dealing with despair, and a lot, lot more. Now, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we received awful news within the horror fiction community and you know the world in general recently with the passing of Dallas Mayer, better known as Jack Ketchum. So, instead of having sponsors today, I want to dedicate this episode to Jack Ketchum and my call to action for you is to go out and to buy Jack Ketchum's work, to read his fiction, to read interviews with him, to watch videos on YouTube, and just really absorb yourself in his stories and in his knowledge. Now, Stephen King famously said, of Jack Ketchum that he was probably the scariest guy in America but he was also probably one of the kindest as well. I mean I read The Girl Next Door at a pivotal moment for me in terms of my development as both a reader and a writer it really was a game changer and it's possibly the novel that I recommend to people the most. Now I'm not going to talk about The Girl Next Door too much because I cannot do it justice. Anything that I say will be selling it short but I I really do recommend that you go out and you read it and I recommend that you pick up his other work as well. Off Season, Red, Right to Life, it's a fantastic short story collection Peaceable Kingdom. There are a number of his stories that are available on Audible. Some that are narrated by Jack Ketchum himself. Please do pick up work by Jack Ketchum. Please do read him and celebrate him. Now I compiled an article on Lit Reactor, Dallas Mayer, The Wisdom of Jack Ketchum. And I'll link to that in the show notes. And yesterday after finding out the the news, after staring at the computer screen in, in disbelief, after going for a long walk and composing myself, I spent the entire day reading interviews with Jack Ketchum and just noting down some of these amazing life and writing lessons that he's he's shared with us, that he's left us with. And I tried to distill from those interviews the best advice I could and to formulate them into some coherent order. And hopefully, if I've done my job right, that's what you'll see over on Lit Reactor. Now, Jack Ketchum wrote a short story called Returns, and he wrote that after he'd had his cat put down. And in the story notes, he said, but the story, of course, is ultimately about connection, not loss. In that sense, it's a celebration. That's what I want us to do. I want us to celebrate the life and the work of Dallas, and I want us to just keep it going. Wonderful writer, wonderful human being. And the celebrations will continue because next week, Bob Pastorella and I are going to be unboxing some of Jack Ketchum's short stories. And usually we reserve these story unboxed episodes for patrons. We're putting it out publicly and... If everything goes well, we should have another podcast joining us for those 
unboxing session, so keep an ear out. Well, with that said, let's jump in to part two of the conversation with Laird Baron. And now for a horror interview. What are, you, what are you guys drinking? Well, as it's quite early here, I've just got some coffee. So a little bit boring, but it will keep me lively for the interview. <laughs> I'm drinking my last, probably for this evening, is going to be my last cup of iced coffee. Well, we started off, got up to about 70 degrees, and by tomorrow morning, it will be 32. And it's already starting to cool off. So uh, I'm feeling I'm probably going to be switching to more warm drinks soon. You're taking advantage of the of the weather to enjoy some iced coffee, I see. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's quite a swing, temperature swing. Oh, yeah. See, well, you have, in Alaska, you got like long, long, long periods of the same, you know, relentless temperature during the winter we have the same thing only it's the summer yep (laughs) where it comes up and you know it gets like in may it gets up to you know 90 and it just stays there (laughs) my uh my my dad's from texas actually Mm -hmm. so i heard i i've passed through it i've never experienced the summer there but he had he comes from pampa texas and so he had quite a few Quite a few stories from his early life uh, there. Yeah, that, I'm trying to think where that's at. I want to say that's probably... It's on, the, it's on the Panhandle, I guess. I have to look at a map, but he said it's on the Panhandle. Right. I'm more. On, I'm on the other end. I'm, I'm about 30 minutes away from Louisiana. Mm. So, swamp country. Swamp country. Gators. <laughs> gators. We got gators in the streets. Yeah. <laughs> it does happen. Yeah, it does happen. So what about you, Led? What are you drinking? I mean, obviously scotch, but what's on the I, menu tonight? I'm drinking the good stuff tonight in honor of this uh, podcast. Um, I am drinking uh, Bonnehaven 12. All right. It's very, very rich, very smooth. My girlfriend, uh, she got it for me as a Christmas present. Yeah, well, we appreciate you honoring the podcast. It was such a fine drink. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I don't know if you've ever tried it, if you're into scotch, but this is, a, you know, there's, there's higher dollar stuff, but this is pretty pretty pricey and pretty damn good. Mm. I've, uh, I, try, I try new stuff all the time. I've, I've been into scotch for about 12 years now. And um, cause I used to just drink, like in Alaska, I drank. <laughs> beer and Jack Daniels. That was my vodka, stuff like that. Cheaper right. the better. Right. But somebody, I forget, you know, I want to say it might have been Paul, somebody like that. John Langan, somebody. They were like, oh, you should try this. You know what? Actually, it might have been Peter Schraub. I was at some event, and Peter Peter Schraub and Jeff Ford, of course, are very, uh, are very good uh, people to talk to about scotch and uh, different, different hard hard liquor drinks and uh so between that group you know uh, those four guys they got me kind of turned on to uh the good stuff yeah because like i mean i imagine your friendship with john langan was foraged on scotch and horror pretty much we were uh good combination yeah i you know we became friends you know well before uh social networking was was you know, with such a big, with so mainstream, you know, I was never on, uh, what was it, Usenet or any of that kind of stuff. I never, I never really participated in that, but no. So we were just, we wrote, uh, we, we, we talked to each other via email, but that was it. And, um, yeah, we were, we were, because we appeared in, uh, we had our debut professional debuts about the same time, you know, within a month or two of each other. And I really liked his story and he liked my story. And we just became, you know, over, over the course of time, we became good friends. Mm. Yeah, I think when we had John on, he was talking about like various movie nights that you have where you'll watch a horror film, drink a lot of scotch and critique it together. And I thought, man, that's like one hell of a combination for movie nights. We, 
we haven't done it. Uh, it's been a few months because of various things going on in our lives, mostly in my case, just because uh, this novel really just took over my life, um, as they tend to do. But, it, you know, and, and part of the problem was I, I had to do a lot more work at the, the latter end of the year than I would have liked because my dog got really sick earlier this year or earlier in 2017 and that sucked some life out of me and it I was kind of like on the floor with her kind of tending to her 24 hours a day for a while there and uh so I ended up having to do more back-end work than I wanted to and I didn't get to go I didn't get to see John much but yeah we have a tradition you know I lived with them for a long time when I first came here I rented a room from them and then you know now I live uh kind of in a little valley dairy farm dairy farms all around in the mountains the cat skills are not too far and john's about a 20 minute drive for me but uh generally speaking i try to go see him once a week and mm. and we want you know like we either watch uh if there's a good you know series on we'll watch it together but in the summertime we'll watch we'll, we'll marathon a couple of years ago we marathoned um uh, japanese um samurai you know samurai flicks and 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 a bunch of yakuza uh, you know, gangster, uh, noir kind of uh, films. And it's a lot of fun to, to talk to him about films because he knows, you know, he knows so much about it anyway. And, um, you know, he has a tendency to like to, to rewrite things. You know, that would have been perfect if they would have done this, this, and this. So he's mm. a, it's a hoot. But quite often you find with writers that they'll see a film and they'll think right these are the things they should have done and then that can actually be the impetus for a story actually that's a good that, that's a good point uh i have written a few stories that were not directly responses to something i'm watching but i would you know i'm watching something and it it just stirs something in the sediment in my you know in my brain i go ah. Oh. And sometimes it's related, and sometimes it isn't. But it, you know, a piece. Sometimes music does that for me as well. Or look at looking at a piece of beautiful art or grotesque art. Uh, it just, it's like, it, it's like it stir, flips over a rock somewhere in the muck, at the bottom of my 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 my, my consciousness, and I, I start uh, thinking about you know a story, mm. and and yeah, in John's case, I think John, he's because he's an adjunct professor, and he. He does a lot of grading and critiquing of, of students' essays and, and, and stories and whatnot. He's really acclimated to tearing the stuff apart and rewriting it. I, I have a lot less interest in that. I I appreciate stuff, and sometimes I'll come up with, well, the ending would have been better if. But generally speaking, John is far more uh, – that's far more his his area of expertise and then inflicting it on me. Cause I'm like, it was a terrible movie, John. Why are you rewriting? Why are we, why are we <laughs> rewriting this movie for no money? Let's not, let's move on to something else. He goes, well, wait, just this one more thing about this movie. Uh, it's a good part of my life. I have to say, you know, I talk to John, uh, every, every few nights we, we chat for quite a while on the phone. And, um, it's, that is a, that's probably one of the better parts of my, my professional career and also just my life in general is to is to have John uh, as somebody that I can talk to about this stuff. Mm. Well, something that I wanted to talk about is, of course, your forthcoming novel, Blood Standard, but I feel like we have a dilemma. I mean, we have an awful lot we can talk about anyway, so I'm wondering, would you actually want to do a podcast again in April and then we can make it more blood standard specific so obviously we'll mention it in this podcast but we'll then go deeper into crime and into blood standard in April that would if you guys are game for that that's fine with me I crime is a I would have to say crime is probably my first love over horror so uh, there'd be plenty I'd be happy to chat about just crime in general, you know, noir in general. That sounds awesome. Okay. The yeah, relationship between yeah. horror and crime is so strong. I mean, it's just... Yep. Oh, yeah, their hand. It's Especially noir. It's just... It's hand in hand. You know, I have a tendency to kind of be a little fast and loose with the terms, but I mean, definitely in noir and, and some types of crime, horror is such a... There's certain elements of horror uh, that just mingle so nicely. I've, and I've done it most of my career. 
you know, most of my stories are, uh, I would say, affect wise, they're crime, they're crime or in war, more so than horror, you know, a good, a good percentage of them are at least. Mm hmm. And it becomes something else when you mix the horror. And there's, you know, I would never say, "Oh, these are crime stories." I, my first novel, Blood Standard, is definitely a, a crime, you know, slash war. It, it plays very fair with the rules. I mean, I don't. It's not a stealth horror novel. It has horrific, absolutely horrific uh, overtones and undertones. And I think fans of my work in general, if you like my work in general, I don't know. I think this would be something you might enjoy because I think just the genre is probably something you like anyway. But it it is a you know for anybody who's wondering no it's a crime it's a you know it is a it is a mainstream traditional uh, crime novel it's just you know it's told the way I tell stories that's all uh, you know it, it's filtered through me and if you like that then you know it might be something that'll interest you mm. but I think there's something there for you know not to belabor it but just that I think there's something there though you know part of my goal in writing that novel was to reach the crime you know wider audience I wrote a com what I hope is a commercial novel. And, um, you know, I didn't, you know, I wanted to bring as many of my readers, you know, I have a, I have a loyal core of fans, um, who are very supportive of everything I do. And I wanted to bring as many, many of them as I could, but I also, you know, a huge goal of this particular, you know, not of all my writing, I mean, I'm still going to do other, you know, the stuff that I normally do. I'm still going to write short fiction, uh, and probably some crazy horror novels if I get the chance. But this was really my attempt to write, uh, a mainstream novel and hopefully a series and, and reach a larger audience. Cause that's really crucial for me at this point. Uh, psychologically, monetarily, visibility wise is to, you know, is to always, you know, is to try to break through to a larger crowd because that in turn allows me to do, it'll subsidize, you know, emotionally and, and materially it'll, it'll sort of enable me to continue doing the things that, you know, that I've been known for in the past. Well, I know that a lot of people have been speaking about you making this shift into crime with this novel, but for me, it does feel like a very natural progression. I mean, your work has always been diverse, and whilst the first two collections were more grounded in the weird and Lovecraftian, if you look at Swift to Chase, that was certainly moving more towards crime and real-life horror, and... You look at your novella, Man With No Name, I mean, it doesn't get much more crime than the Yakuza, does it? No, and, and frankly, I've, I've done, I, you know, I've written historicals that you could take the supernatural element. I, in other words, I could have achieved the aim of, of fulfilling, you know, publisher guidelines or editorial guidelines with less of you know, with a, with a reduced supernatural element, I still would have been able to, to do that. And so I've written a lot of stories that absolutely the, the weird element is inextricable, but I've also intentionally written a lot of stories where no, it's uh that's part of it, but you could take, you, you could, it's modular. You could take that out and replace it with something else. And, and you might have a different story, but it would still be a functioning story. This novel is definitely, uh, and the series in general, there, the it does it does gear it does gear toward the supernatural, but it, and the horrific, but only in the way that we kind of run across in in, in real life, P possibly in rare instances, but it's it's not unheard of the stuff that occurs in my you know in in this series, and I really wanted to make sure that that's uh, you know something that I stick to. It's it's set in the same universe as as. Uh, for at least one of them, you know, and all my other stuff. So, you know, so because somebody asked me, they said, "Was well, this the same universe as the Children of Old Leech?" I'm like, "Absolutely," but keep keep in mind that just because you know, I mean, just because Old Leech is in this universe, most people will never encounter that kind of stuff. They don't, and so it's it's sort of immaterial. You know, it's it's important, but it it isn't going to be a uh, it isn't going to be a, a motivating factor in how these narratives play out. Yeah, we've got a number of. Patreon questions. In fact, we might have the most Patreon questions we've ever had. So that's why I'm jumping in early doors oh, with these. Sure. sure. And so I'll take the ones that are related to crime and related to blood standard first. So Alan Baxter says, 
You're moving more directly into crime with Blood Standard, probably my most anticipated book this year. But I saw you mention on social media that it's got a fair dose of horror too. What do you see as the connection between crime and horror? Can you have one without the other, given that horror doesn't have to be supernatural? Absolutely. Uh, I think if all you have to do, you look no further than um, the, um, you know, Silence of the Lambs, for example, or Red Dragon. Uh, they function as, you know, I'm sure people argue about what they really are, but those are crime thrillers, but they're also horror novels. And uh, so, yeah, I would say I would say you could, you know, th there's no question that you can do that because you know, some of this stuff is really uh, debatable. You know, I guarantee you there are people who are going to argue, oh, you know, uh, this book or that book isn't isn't as it's as it's advertised. You know, that's not a crime novel. That's something else. Um, but just from my perspective, there, there is uh, and as far as what the relationship is, I don't know that there's a relationship in the sense that you can just look at them and go, oh, well, this is this this is how they are related de as a definition. But I think that they often tread along the same paths because stuff occurs in in, in noir in noir definitely uh because you know noir is a much broader more amorphous i mean it's it's definitely something i would that i have a a, a pretty strong idea of what a, a film noir is or what what a novel uh, looks like in that genre but there is you do have some latitude and I think horror, though you know, crime is is a, is a little more stringently defined. But I think I think uh, because you don't require a supernatural element, only a psychological element, uh, to be to to be classified as horror to tread in that territory. Of course, you're going to see examples of um, you know uh, where they cro basically where they where they cross over uh, and mingle. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think that Silence of the Lambs is probably one of the most debated books in terms of what genre it fits into, but as I said before, I'm just more interested in whether it was a good story, whether I enjoyed it, and I did, so I feel no need to decide what marketing label it should fit under. Hey, and uh, Yeah, and unless I'm... I'm kind of tasked with having to sell it, then that isn't a concern of mine. No, I mean, we can just enjoy it. I mean, unless you're a critic, uh, you know, unless your job, an academic, a critic, you know, uh, unless your job is to, is, to, is to rigidly define something, you don't have to. As an author, I don't. It's not my job to define my stuff anyway. You know, uh, Putnam is, is deciding what, what, how to label these things. I just try to use broad terminology. I sort of interchangeably have been using crime and, and, and war because it sort of, I think it veers back and forth. Um, but why, but it's not a horror, you know, it's definitely not a horror novel. I think intentionality has something to do with it. I think it, maybe this is an arbitrary standard, but you know, uh, I don't think something becomes a horror novel until there's like a certain, a certain threshold gets, that gets crossed combined with maybe the intention of it and you you run into that all the time when you try to send something to an editor i used to uh you know well this is not you know this is not enough horror this is not enough science fiction i mean gordon van gelder is very you know and he's one of the more respected guys and, he, and he's worked mainstream you know he's worked as a mainstream editor uh for saint martin's i believe the bottom line is he will tell you this is not genre in his opinion this is not genre enough this doesn't have or this this doesn't have sufficient fans you know fantastic elements in it so yeah we can you know we can debate all of it but i think i think reasonable people you know would agree that while we might debate on what the exact numbers or formula would be that there is sort of this idea that yeah that's kind of you know that particular book like silence of the lambs definitely veering toward you know is it a horror novel or is it a you know is that a is that a, a noir a crime or a thriller i mean there's you know but we do know that those things that, that it's touching those things. Same thing with Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. I've called it a horror novel for years. Other people, uh, critics, will refer to it as a western. You know, it's a it's an interesting question. You know, but in my mind, that that's pretty that that's that's pretty blatantly a, a horror novel as far as I, how I codify these things.
Yeah. Right. I mean, if Red Dragon or Silence of the Lambs or Blood Meridian or even the, like a film like Bone Tomahawk, if they're not horror, then you're going to you – know, I think the only reason people would ever debate it is because that it's challenging what their personal definition of horror is. They need to broaden their horizons. Good. That's a, you know? yeah, I a hundred percent because a lot of people like to, you know, horror is sort of, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it can be considered a derogatory reference. Um, and a lot of people will say, I don't read horror. If we read Stephen King. Well, yeah, but I, hearts in Atlantis and, Joyland and stuff like well you know or, or even some of his horror stuff well I that's Stephen King which is fair fair point I mean he's a genre into, unto himself but how it's packaged has a has a tendency to be how it's received and I think Cormac McCarthy that that book if it were labeled horror would have fewer readers of course and so to some degree I don't blame authors and I don't blame uh, publicists and marketers for doing basically being cagey about how they represent stuff because it's not i don't think anybody's trying to trick anybody it's just you know though that if you say horror a lot of people think oh it's it's you know women being being butchered or it's animal cruelty or whatever it's some you know they have an idea a small they have a this idea a very very limited idea of what horror is and the reality of it is horror is one of the broadest genres um and so, so I don't blame, I, I don't really blame writers who are hesitant to, to say that they're, you know, that they're horror writers. I, I kind of under, I kind of understand that. Cause I gotta tell you just anecdotally, it's for my entire career. So I've been doing this for about 20 years and <clears throat> what do you write? And I take a breath and I either, I either, I just avoid the question entirely and just kind of blow it off or if I'm, t- you know, and this is a polite conversation, you know, in person, I go, well, I write horror and it's kind of like this because the minute you say horror, their eyes start, gl- you know, they just, uh. so I explain what it is. When you read Stephen King, it's not really like that, but it's like, it, it's more like that than it's like this other stuff. Oh, okay. I got to tell you, just talking to the average person. Oh, you're right. What are you writing? Oh, I'm writing a crime novel. Wow. Where is it? What, 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 what? It's like, you know, Big Bang or it's, you know, it's Spencer. It's what, I mean, instant, there's an instant uh, connection with a lot more people. So it won't really influence how I think about myself or even how I, how I talk about myself necessarily. But I do, I do, you know, anthropologically have noted that it's way easier. It's just way easier just to say, yeah, I write thrillers. I'm right. I'm writing crime. You don't have to explain another thing. Yeah, I, I get that. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm, I might carry that out as an experiment just to <laughs> see the different reactions. But I can, I can certainly see how that would work. And for, for whatever reason, crime and thriller is just more palatable and more accepted by the mainstream. Even if you're describing the same book as is the case with Blood Meridian. But I think one of the things that we're trying to do with this is horror, which of course has horror in the name, is to show that there is a broad spectrum. You know, this is horror to Livia Llewellyn, Jack Ketchum, Stephen Graham Jones, Gemma Files. They're all horror, but they're all very, very different in terms of aesthetic and in terms of style and in terms of what they're doing. Peter Straub, one of the more literary writers you're going to run into. I right. mean, he's... You know, he's a great American literary author. I don't rate Cormac McCarthy a, a wit above Peter Straub, you know, as a on a career level. You know, perhaps uh, McCarthy, you know, Blood Meridian, I think, is one of the great novels. I think he's done a couple. But if you just look at them in total, the bottom line is, is Peter Straub, is, for my money, is pound for pound one of the great writers. So is Jeffrey Ford. And they're both, uh, Peter Straub is primarily what, we would consider a horror author over his career, but he's, he shows you though, what, you know, what literary horror can do because he, he does a lot of stuff that could also be called mystery or suspense. And, uh, and he approaches horror. I think that's what my favorite authors, they approach horror as an ingredient, not as the, as the primary, I mean, you can do it. It could be the primary, uh, 
color or ingredient or element. But I think one of the things I love about guys like uh, Ford and, and Straub and Livia is that the eroticism in her case, uh, yeah, the, the literary the, the literary and, and careful, meticulous nature of Ford and Straub uh, and setting up setting up these stories in a in a mundane or prosaic way, uh, a naturalistic way is just as important as the horror elements. I think that's one of the things I love about them is that they just they write it as if they were writing a New Yorker piece and then they inject they inject some horror into it. I think that's a really wonderful, a really wonderful thing. Yeah. I think Brian Evans then perhaps falls into that same category as yeah. well. Uh, absolutely. I, Brian's one of the, you know, he, he's one of the really, really fine stylists. And uh, so is uh, Stephen Graham Jones. Those are two, you know, two guys that I, you know, highly uh, respect what they do. And they couldn't, you know, the thing is, and they're, they're both uh, professors or they've, you know, they've both been academics, currently are academics. And yet they're, they're, they're so different, and that, and I think that's one of the strengths of this entire field right now. I'm, you know, I'm glad that you have this sh- this show. Is that uh, it's such a spectrum of people that you've had on, and as you said, there's so many more you haven't gotten to. This is a this is kind of a a bounty of great, you know, dark. You know, whether you want to call it weird or horror, I think it touches multiple genres. But you know, dark fantasy, horror, weird fiction. Uh, there's a lot of good work being done, and you have people who are working kind of shoulder to shoulder uh, in, that don't necessarily sound alike, but you can see the relationships between their kind of between their influences and how they, and how they react to them. And then you have people working at the other end of the spectrum who are doing more visceral, mm. you know, maybe it's one end, it's one end, it's purely subtle and it's quiet and it's elliptical. The other end, you're getting punched right in the mouth by Norm Partridge, who's an excellent uh, stylist. He's a two fisted kind of writer. You know, I put Brian Evanson kind of at the quieter end. I put, although he can he can let him rip, let her rip. But uh, Norm Partridge is, you know, I, I said it in the past. I wrote something about him. You know, he welds noir and you know kind of traditional pulp uh, crime with you know horror. And he's also quite capable of writing a extremely subtle kind of nuanced piece. But but his but his pleasure is to write you know uh, very bombastic and very much you know, uh, attack oriented kind of stuff. And I, I think that's says nothing but good things about the strength of the field that we have the spectrum of high quality, uh, of writing going on. Yeah. And when we interviewed you on the website, I think it must've been five years or so ago now. And you were talking about violence within horror and there's a quote that I've specifically pulled up because I thought it just kind of captured violence and its effect so well so you said violence and suffering can be crucial to a horror story but without proper context good characterization and psychological nuance it's just a matter of shredding paper dolls in a variety of equally soulless methods a kid pulling wings off a fly. Uh, uh, you, you absolutely nailed it. Well, and this is not to diss pornography, but on one end of the romance uh, field and horror, um, I mean, there's there's a point where a lot of these things converge. I think, just in a in a in a mathematical way, or a physics, a sense of physics. Uh, when like redu- you know reduced to their pure, just sort of their pure essence. Yeah, you have a por- there. There can be a pornographic element to horror, and I don't mean in the way that most people think of. You know, uh, TNA. I mean, non. You know, there's not much reciprocity. It's just pure affect. You know, bodies grinding against bodies, and that can happen. You know, whether it's violence or whether it's 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 a uh, sexual congress. If there's no context. You, it's possible that it can be done in a way that the very aesthetic of it, of, of viewing it, may be couched in such a way that even lacking context, there's some artistry, like an inst- like an art installation, an abstract, you know, that maybe there's for some for some reason the how it was filtered through the 
the writer or the or the cinematographer's lens, it, it's a spectacle without need of context. But generally speaking, basically nobody, you know, very few people are that talented, and 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 so we need context. No, what you're talking about though is is, is something that that has really kind of bugged me for a long time. Is you know, you have these these writers that are really trying to push out, you know, what they call extreme horror, you know, and I have, I have no desire to read it because, and man, we get we get requests, you know, for reviews and stuff like that, and they usually provide a link, you know, in there, and so I'll go and and read it, and, and I'd say probably about a, maybe a, a tenth of these books are are extreme horror, and I I can't get through the first page, and I'm just like, it, there's no there's no sense of professionalism. There's no sense of, of actually trying to tell me a story. You're trying to shock me. Uh, yeah, man, I'm a, I'm a horror reader. You, you ain't going to shock me. Not without no context. Not without building up to an emotional impact, which you were talking about how the stakes are there. The stakes have to be high, you know, and I think that that's important. And so just doing violence for violence sake, I'm, you know, just there's, there's a market for that, but I'm, that's not me. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that was the crux of the quote that I pulled that you said in that interview. And I think, of course, some, something can be technically extreme horror like martyrs, but still have something good about it and something to appreciate. So I'm not going to say that everything that could be categorized as extreme horror is terrible, but yeah, I'll certainly agree to the point that you need something other than that. You can't just have extreme horror, otherwise it's just a wank onto the page, which is a far more crude way of putting what you've already said really eloquently. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, I agree with that too. I mean, there, there's there's some people who can really kind of pull it off, you know, but uh, those are far and few between. Well, I, I think in fairness that basically the problems because I don't really want to I don't want to dismiss extreme horror or anybody you know because people enjoy extreme horror and I have colleagues who write it and uh, it's more that it's you know when I made my statement about the violence having you know, it has to have some sort of relevance and some sort of uh, context. I'm not really trying to call any, I'm not saying, oh, that, that a particular um, genre can't have that. What I'm kind of getting at is, like I said, in fairness, is that it's that some things are just more noticeable because of the very nature of the genre. If you, if you, if you are, because here's the bottom line is Sturgeon said it, 90% of everything is not, it's not good. Um, so I don't think that it's, I don't necessarily think that it's, uh, that there's anything wrong with a particular genre of horror, that there's, that there's more, you know, people who are doing uh, bad work than some other genre. It's nothing like that. It's just that missteps in horror are so, are, are dealing with touchy subject matter compared to other, you know, when you write a comedy, if it's not funny, it's just not funny, you know, generally speaking, and depending on what the stakes are in the story, but you know, a lot like science fiction, oh, it's just, you know. It was the it was pretty soulless, you know. It was all about the the theory and not the characterization, or the science was bad or whatever. And, but the reactions are less visceral because those are not intrinsically visceral um, subjects. So I try to be careful about how I even you know personally, privately think about things I don't like about horror because I have to keep in mind that we tend to overreact to it simply. In other words, out of proportion to whether it was a bad story or bad writing or what have you. It's just that, you know, hor horror is visceral. Uh, and so you're going to notice these things and you're going to have you're going to have a reaction to them. Uh, you know, some people are very jaded. Like, Bob, it sounds like you're pretty jaded. But, you know, other people have a lot more uh, are affected much more. They're disgusted, you know, not just because, oh, the writing was bad, but because they're. You know, it's amplified by the very fact that of what of what's being dealt with, and so I try to I try to, I try to keep an even keel with that, and not because I don't I don't think it's very useful for me to, you know, to say why well, you know this is a worthless uh, genre or something like that. I just I will say this though I think extremes 
in any genre are hard to pull off. And so it's a big, it's a big risk, right? Extreme horror. Uh, if you want to be taken seriously, because I, I think it's a difficult genre to do. Right. And I, I agree. And I would say I'm pretty jaded. You're right. <laughs> but I, I definitely need to, to try to keep a more open mind. I mean, cause I, I tell that to people and, and sometimes it's really hard to follow your own advice. So, uh, that, and that's one of the things that, you know, I always try to, to work on and, uh, I'm glad you reminded me of that. <laughs> well, I wasn't. I, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to remind you. I was just. I'm more talking about myself, and you know, I can only speak for myself. And I just feel like there's stuff. I try to remember that just because I don't like it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with whether it's worthy or not. There's things I like and things I don't like, and I try to. I try to separate what I don't like from what isn't. What I consider critically isn't very good and you know and I, I have a little bit of experience with that you know i've done some editing and i've i've sat on uh the world fantasy award you know jury and i've i've, I've been on the uh, shirley jackson jury uh, a couple times and, and of course i've written a lot of um essays and introductions you know relatively speaking over the last few years and so i've up until up until like the last year or so i've been inundated with you know uh books from publishers i mean i've really I've really been able to read a lot and look at things, not just as a writer, but like trying to read things, you know, uh, critically as a reader, you know, how does this, how does this sound? How does this feel? And so I have been trying to develop uh, this idea that to be very careful, you know, that my taste uh, doesn't override my, you know, the re the reality of the situation. The bottom line is I'm not a good judge of, of uh, certain types of literature, and I, I probably have no business casting any kind of uh, judgment on it. Well, I'd say with Bob, I mean, you might be jaded, but you're also reflective, and you are open to changing your mind. So I know that if you now go and read an extreme horror book that you absolutely love this week, you'll be the first to admit it. So, you know, I think it's okay to be jaded if you also have that reflective quality. Well, that's just, I try to do that, but, uh, it's, and I'm just talking about the stuff that I see, you know, that I've seen recently, and I say recently over the last couple of years, you know, and I grew up, you know, I got to see the beginning and the end and the, the morph and the change of what people call splatterpunk, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, and there's, and there's, I think there's still people who do it today who, who to, to some degree, I mean, Ed Kurtz, you know, bleed. That's one hundred percent splatterpunk, you know. <laughs> and and then that that book was, you know, has come out like in the last five years. So you know, it, there's people that are still doing it, and they're doing it with heart and soul, and you know, and I think extreme horror is just another variation of that. And there's some of it out there that's got you know heart and soul. You know, I would highly, I would want to read it. <laughs> I'm just going to say before I forget, I wouldn't want to classify him as a um, extreme horror guy because he does, that would actually be a disservice considering that he does so many different things. But Nate Southard uh, is really, really exemplary. He can, uh, he's a blue collar kind of writer and some of his stuff is exploitation style writing and some of it's splatterpunk infused. And he really, and I, I and the thing is, is in, in that stuff, I don't like as much either one. But he is a great, you know, I can easily recognize, uh, even amongst, you know, the, the stories that are not necessarily in my genre that he does, uh, that he's just really good. He's really good at that. So if you ever want to try some more, you know, something really raw, uh, Nate Southard is, is, is the guy. That's a great recommendation. Uh, and, and a matter of fact, I've, I've got one of his uh, collections here, and I guess. That's a good place to start. That's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Because you get, if you get one of his collections, especially, uh, will the sun ever come out again? Uh, right, that's the one. I that's have. a that's one of his. You know, it, there's only what, I think four story. It's, it's a smaller collection as far as numbers, but it really shows his range. You really to really properly appreciate him, you need to look at a collection so you can get an idea of what he's capable of. That's next on the list. Very good. Yeah, I've heard good things about Nate, and I think. Last year, he was interviewed on J. David Osborne's podcast as well. So, 
certainly one to check out. Well, our next Patreon question is from Dan Howarth. And yes, for people listening, that is our former co-host of the This Is Horror podcast. So he returns as a patron asking a question. And he says, I read a number of articles and interviews citing your work as an influence for the first season of True Detective. How did that feel? Did you enjoy the show? And has it led to any extra sales or opportunities? Yeah. Um, I, To be diplomatic, I have a, a continually evolving set of emotions about that whole thing. Um, I've not watched every episode through. I've, I've watched a bunch of the episodes. I've seen the last couple in their entirety. I watched uh, the fourth episode, the first episode. So there's eight episodes. I've probably watched four of them in their entirety and pieces of the rest. And of course, I've had people gleefully tell me blow by blow the stuff I've, I might have missed. Um, initially, when it came about, I was ex- extremely excited. I've been a, I've been a champion of Pizzolatto's work for a long time. And he approached me, actually, back in, I want to say 2007 or eight. It was not too long after uh, the Amigo sequence came out, and he loved it. And he had um, you know, a collection at the time, and he sent me... He sent me a copy, and I loved it. It was it was really well written, and I. And so we we never became buddies, but we did correspond, you know, off and on. Each one of my books that came out, I sent him a copy, and he always was kind and responded immediately. And uh, you know, uh, I, I feel like we had a pretty good relationship. Then he sold Galveston like in 2010 or so, and uh, that was quite successful for him, critically at least. Uh, you know, he got the right people really, you know, liked it. And he did, you know, he did, he did the tour, you know, he was interviewed by the Miami, I want to say the Herald, you know, some big papers. And he did, he, he, he uh, occasionally mentioned, you know, liking my stuff, how much he liked my stuff, etc. He was very generous in that regard. I, and I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, things have changed, you know, he, he, uh, since the show has become extremely successful, I think, and this probably happens to a lot of people who have sudden fame. You know, they realize they can't they can't be on Twitter anymore, type of thing. And mm-hmm. of course, and also with with the huge controversy that broke out, that seemed to be, you know, the whole the whole plagiarism controversy uh, really changed. You know, he 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 withdrew completely uh, from the weird fiction community after that, to the point where I forget what interview. I want to say the Wall Street Journal, but it might have been you know Vanity Fair or something. Somebody was talking about the influence of the weird on him, and early on, and by early on, I mean months prior, <laughs> episode one versus episode eight. Um, you know, he was quite happy to say, "Oh, well, yeah, yeah." You know, I've read Laird Baron, and I, I've read Ligotti, although he didn't bring up Ligotti until he was sort of, you know, there was a he basically had to come on and say, "Yeah, yeah, I like Ligotti." After all this slap happened, but you know, he obviously Chambers was a huge influence. I mean, probably the, maybe the biggest influence on that first season. And then at the end, you know, well, let's not overblow that. I'm more of a Faulkner guy, which I, I kind of rolled my eye at that, but it, it did, it did anger and hurt some of the community because unfortunately I, th- I felt like a lot of the community felt like it was going to be a supernatural explanation to the story. And they were really kind of hurt. And then you couple that with sort of like, yeah, Faulkner, fuck these other guys. I, there was a, you know, at least that's the interpret. I'm not saying he said that, but that was sort of the interpretation some people had is like, yeah, it was, it was cool for a while, but now, you know, you know, now I'm all grown up. And so, yeah, I have, I have terribly mixed feelings about that. He, you know, elements, elements that seem quite, quite poached from my personal life, uh, made their way into the, the show. I mean, I'm sure the eye patch and the dad being from Texas and Alaska and all this stuff was just, you know, purely coincidental, but, uh, Maybe not, you know, who knows, but, but I did notice it. I did notice, you know, I got to tell you every time I hear uh, time is a flat circle, I kind of, I kind of, I kind of, you know, I kind of raise an eyebrow at that. But um, as far as the actual real impact of it, uh, my sales did go up. You know, you can't be associated with, uh, and, and Ligotti's did, I know, because I was watching his Amazon numbers. Uh, so I think we, both of us 
got some collateral benefit, you know, from, from how popular the show was. Mm. All right. Well, the next crime related question is from Michael Griffin. So he says, you've discussed your early influences in many genres and have mentioned quite a few modern weird fiction writers that you enjoy, but he would like to hear you recommend modern crime, noir, or thriller writers that we should be reading. Well, Pizzolatto's Galveston is, I think, uh, I don't want to go on a limb and say it's a classic, but I think it's an essential modern read. Um, it's a great yeah, it's just beautifully written. I mean, the guy can write. You know, I there's there's no question the guy's super talented, and I would be, you know, I would be remiss in saying you know not saying you should read that. Uh, his collection, I always mess up the title. I, I have it sitting here somewhere uh, between here and the Yellow Sea, I believe. Just a beautiful, stark, kind of frightening. Just some frightening stories in there. It's not, you know, and they're and they're and they're kind of mainstream lit. So that so those are two books by that guy that you should go out and read. Um. I know he's not he's not contemporary, but I am going to throw him out there because I, because I think he was a big influence on Pizzolatto's collection. Is uh, Dickey, Dickey uh, James Dickey, the poet, um, is one of the greats. Uh, I love his poetry, and I also love his uh, you know Deliverance is a great novel. Um, but as far as like somebody that's working today, uh, Karen Warren, I think. Uh, it's mostly just your short fiction, but I I would I would say look her up. I really respect her. Uh, Liz ha- Elizabeth Hand, she's doing the Cast Neary series, and that's just it's just absolutely uh, hard edged, hard boiled. Just you know, I think it's everything that that you would like from a Stieg Larsson, except that it's just beautifully written, and it's you know it's boiled down to it's bo- it's just a lean, mean, nasty series of books and i mean that in the best possible way uh brian evanson i don't think most people would really consider him but they should his cult of mutilation stories and some of his one-offs in his collections the guy is uh you know he understands how that works how how noir works uh, richard thomas who did a novel called disintegration i think he's a great contemporary you know uh people probably you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know whether you guys have heard of him or not. He pu- he published um, Gamut recently. Oh, oh was, yeah, we we know Richard yeah. Thomas. We've had him on the podcast a number of times, and I, yeah. I just think he, he's a great champion of genre generally. Very generous with his time and support. So and a great writer. Yeah. He's a, he's he's kind of a renaissance man, right? He's uh, you know, uh, and like I said, I don't know if you would, you know, I. I don't know that either either he or Evanson would be what you consider. Oh, these are crime writers, but I, I don't really think that way. You know, I mean, I, obviously there's Conley and you know all these other guys, Coben and whatnot. But I I have a tendency to try to read some of the stuff they're doing. Uh, but I, I particularly like uh, I particularly like some of these guys that that came out of the weird or, or at least still play with it. Um, I do like Steve uh, uh, Steve Hamilton. I think he's He's a good, a good writer. Um, and uh, James Lee Burke, somebody else that I've really grown fond of. I, you know, I didn't grow up. Actually, I'm not even sure how long Burke's been around for quite a while, but I mean, he's still going strong. I haven't read his latest, but I didn't get into him until a few years ago. And I really, I really like him uh, a lot. Yeah. He wrote the show novels. He, he's yes. been writing show for so long that Alec Baldwin played show in a movie. Yeah, see, I've never. I can't remember the name of the movie, though. I've never watched uh, that I know of. I've never seen them, and I up until a few years ago, I hadn't. You know, there's just so much out there. Uh, oh yeah, and there's cla- I mean, there's classics I haven't gotten to, and I try to read all the stuff, but he's you know, but it's, it's a pleasure because it's like it's waiting there for you. Like I've never watched The Wire. Uh, the Wire is something that I've been saving. You know, I've seen excerpts of it, but. It's not that I. It's not that it's not my radar. It's sitting there waiting for me, and I know that it's this wonderful. It's this wonderful experience waiting for me. They used to say, I think it was Ted Sturgeon said, "I envy anyone in, encountering Roger Zelazny for the first time." I want to say that's who it was, and and so I've tried to create a you know a, a, a few instances of that. Like I know this guy is good, or I know that 
that lady's good or I know this series is, is, is recommended. I'm going to hold off and I'm, I'm going to, you know, it's, it's waiting for me. And, you know, uh, James Lee Burke was one of those guys because for years people were telling me. And another guy that people were telling me about, he's much newer, is um, Frank Bill. I, I remember five or six years ago I was in uh, Indianapolis with um, – uh, a few people uh, doing it. Uh, we were doing a workshop kind of a thing and um, I went and toured some schools and whatnot but they were they were telling me that I should read this newer writer called Frank Bell and he's is a movie coming out you know uh, I think what was it uh, Donnie Brook I think is the movie yeah and I, I yeah I haven't read a lot of his stuff but he's from what I've read so far he's really good uh, and I only read a few pages of a book that everybody's talking about. She writes Shotgun. I think the guy's name is Harper. Holy crap, I, that guy. Yeah, is it Jordan Harper? I think so, yeah. I only, look, I cannot. Yeah, it's Jordan Harper. I can't vouch, but I read, you you, you know things, but you could tell, at least as far as stylistically. So I read the, you know, the first few pages that I could out of the preview, because everybody was talking about this book, so I'm like, I gotta get it. It's astounding. This person has astounding. This is astounding level of uh, craftsmanship. So I don't necessarily want to say, "Hey, add that person." You know, add Harper to the list. But I, I would be shocked if, if that's an error. I, I think that you know everybody is raving about how good it is. So I, I can see just from the little bit uh, that you know that seems to be the case. Uh, and I'm trying to think. There was one other thing I was lo- I was looking at. Um, Oh, I'm a big Stuart O'Nan. I mean, I guess Stuart O'Nan kind of plays around with lots of genres, but Stuart O'Nan's a great, you know, kind of place with that stuff. He, he's a good writer, um, a wonderful writer. You know, and the guy I haven't ever, I, I don't really talk about enough is somebody that kind of is influencing my crime fiction now is Joseph Wambaugh. I'm a huge, uh, and I don't know whether he's contemporary or not, because I, I, I stopped reading him a few years ago when I, when I basically started, you know, writing horror professionally. And I, was reading a lot of horror because of, of being on juries and whatnot. But Joseph Wambaugh uh, in the eighties and nineties, or especially the nineties, I read a lot of Wambaugh and he really holds up. Yeah. I've read the onion field uh, uh-huh. by Wambaugh and he wrote the choir boys. I think I've read some of that yep. too. Delta Delta star <clears throat> is my, I'm not saying that's his best, but Delta star is, uh, is my favorite of his that I've read. I remember, I can't remember if it was the onion field or if it was the cardboard, but I think it was the onion field. There was one scene and it just, it's so out of context, but it just, it stuck with me forever was the fact that during, I think during the Vietnam war that they were having a problem with like basically making like nylon hose and women would, they couldn't wear hosiery. So they had to use a dye to tan their legs so it looked like they were wearing hose. And there was a woman in a scene where you could, he, he mentions that in the scene and that stuck with me. It was like, how do you just come up with these little tidbits of history that you just, you know, and it just, for whatever reason that it's, it sticks with you and it propels the scene. I was just like, wow, man, this is like, that's, I'm pretty sure that's the onion field. Which is a uh, basic, you know, it's a nonfiction piece, but he, right. you know, He's well. He's just a storyteller. It doesn't really matter what the the mode is. He that's how he that's just how he does right. it. He just he's very much like Stephen King in that regard. His voice is a little more muted. You know, I think that he he's more restrained. But he 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 kind of puts you in the mindset of the beat cop or the detective with equal facility or the criminal right. even. And so yeah, I, you know, obviously that's not quite what Mike was was asking, but I. He is somebody, though, that's modern and contemporary enough that I, I'm, I'm just going to throw him on there anyway because he, he has a huge, a huge influence on me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, now that I'm, you know, hopefully segueing into writing more crime novels, you know, I, I'm going to find myself reading more and more of, of, of contemporary, uh, contemporary crime. But I, I have to admit, though, the vast majority of my education in literature with the exclusion of some horror and the weird specifically is a education that reaches back into the forties uh, and is, you know, into the eighties. That's that stretches. Uh, and maybe to my advantage and what, you know, one regard, I mean, I try to keep up with what's going on in general terms. 
but I find that, you know, my style is more hewn from, from stuff that people aren't really looking at as they're, you know, a lot of writers today aren't looking at John D. McDonald, uh, who's another one of my heroes. You know, they're not looking at Robert Parker, who you know, at his best was just as good as anybody else. They're looking more at, you know, Coben or Woods or Conley or whomever, uh, you know, Steve Larson or what, what have you. And so I have a tendency to, to be drawing, you know, from a different well. But that said, you know, I it's a daunting task to try to even think about catching up with crime because you think horror or weird fi- fiction, I think we're, horror and weird fiction are hard to keep up with. Crime is, you know, relatively speaking, is exponentially. It goes right back to what I said earlier. You mm-hmm. say, oh, I'm writing a crime novel. And everybody's like, oh, because they all like, they all have a crime or a noir novel or author that they like, you know. And so this is a real... You know, this is going to be a big challenge for me is to is to continue my my you know ongoing education uh, in the field. Well, that's how I try to tell people all the time. In, in crime, <clears throat> the only thing that's really changed between you know back then and now is the tech. You know, there's still you, you know, criminals are desperate people, and some of these writers they managed to capture that on the page in such a way that it is, I mean, you can't help, but to, you know, keep reading and be inspired at the same time. I no, I agree. I, I'm an Elroy fan, for example, that was, uh, you know, one of the more contemporary guys that I like. And one thing I have noticed though, and I'm not going to name any names, but Elroy, you know, just coming at it, you know, like I said, I grew up on, on that stuff, but, but then for the last 15 years, I've kind of stepped away from it. So I'm not, you know, I'm not as caught up on it as I, as I would like to be. But looking at some of the modern, you know, contemporary writers, I see that Elroy's influence is powerful in the same way that, um, you know, people who hew a little too closely to H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, you can kind of, you get the idea, oh, you've been reading some Lovecraft lately with that story. Not just the, the themes or the, or the narrative, how it's, but just like even the language. And I, I notice a lot of people, or I shouldn't say a lot, I notice some writers trying to emulate, uh, you know, uh, the staccato delivery. Same thing with Elmore Leonard. You see that, you see that influence to people trying to consciously or sub- or unconsciously, you know, emulating his rhythms and stuff. So those guys are, you know, very, uh, uh, influential, uh, even, you know, even, even some of the stuff that's come out the last four or five years, I, I see that Elmore Leonard still, you know, is influencing people. <laughs> Yeah, I went through a period of about three years where I tried to read as much Elroy as I possibly could. And it got to the point to where when Perfidia come out that I, I read maybe a, a third of it and I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and he had even kind of tapered back on it was still, you know, quite staccato, but it was there were some more, you know, lengthy phrases and things but it's just it was just too much you know and, and you can only handle so much of that style you think it's cool at first but after a while it's like oh come on man you're just like mimicking yourself now so i don't know i'm kind of i'm kind of have mixed emotions about elroy black Dahlia, well, though yeah Oof. i Oof. it's the Oof. it's the double-edged blade of having a or, you know it's the double edge of having a style you know, the, the more distinct your style is, uh, the more ri- ripe it is for parody and also for you know, wearing people out. So that's just, you know, I don't read Stephen King very much anymore, but I don't I don't really attribute that to Stephen King. I attribute that to I read a lot of Stephen King and now I don't. And I think you could say that about a lot of a, a lot of artists, whether it's music or whether it's writing, for example, those two, you know, maybe even filmmakers to some degree. But you you read enough of them. And if you stop reading them, it doesn't always mean that there's anything wrong with what they're doing. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're even repeating themselves necessarily. It just, I think in some cases, like in my case, a lot of the times it has more to do with, okay, I've seen, you know, I've, exp- I've had my experience with this author or, or musician or whatever. And now I'm, you know, no harm, no foul, but now I'm doing something else. And, and the thing is, is that it doesn't diminish their importance in my, you know, the fact that I haven't read Wamba. Uh, or Martin Cruz Smith for a long time does not diminish one iota my um, indebtedness to, to, you know, to what they've given me over the years as a reader and as a writer. 
I know exactly where you're coming from because I don't read much Stephen King in, anymore either. I mean, it's like you, it, it's not like you're going through this phase, but it, you've you've gotten you've gotten what you needed out of it, right? You know, yeah. you change, you change, you're in a exactly. different place, and, and the thing is, is you are aware that you know you only have so many years, and there's so much. You know, I'll never get, to, I'll never be able to even write all the stories that I want to write. You know, people talk about, oh, I don't know what I'm going to write next. I I actually, my problem is the opposite. I'm always, you know, which one of these gets gets shuffled down, you know, because it doesn't isn't right for this time. So, you know, you change, and, and that's just that's just the way it is. And I, I've actually just come to accept it as opposed to, you know, maybe feel a little melancholy, but I don't, just because I don't read Elroy as much, or I don't read Wamba or whomever, I don't downgrade them. I, I'm more, it's more just... You know, now I'm reading uh, Brian Evanson, and, I, and that's just the way it is. And I only have so many hours in the day. There you go. Thank you so much for listening to our episode with Laird Barron. We will be back next episode with the third and final part of the conversation. But if you want to get it ahead of the crowd, all you need to do is support us over on Patreon. Just one dollar, www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And recently I set myself an ambitious challenge, you'll say. You know, you could say an insane challenge, but I'm going for ambitious because I think, I think we can do this. I think it's going to be difficult. I think there's going to be a lot of work that's going to be needed to be put into it. But I want us to reach a thousand patrons by January 2020. And I mean, look, my belief is this, that there are a thousand people who get so much value from the podcast that they will be prepared to pledge a dollar a month. Now, the problem is that I'm just not sure that all 1,000 people are even aware that the This Is Horror podcast exists. So I've got to spread the word. I've got to make more people aware of what we're doing. So, I mean, this is where you come in, whether you are or aren't a patron. Every time you share an episode, you're making the This Is Horror podcast more visible. Every iTunes review really does count. The more people who leave us a review, the more visible we are on iTunes, the more chance we have of breaking into the iTunes rankings. We do that, it's potential for us to be on the main page. And that could translate in more listeners, in more downloads, in more Patreon support, which means more episodes for you. That's the second thing I'll be doing to try and grow the This Is Horror podcast. I'm going to look at transitioning into making this a twice per week show. Now, as I say, transitioning, so it's not going to happen automatically, but where possible, I'm going to make that happen. Maybe there'll be a little bit of a, a blip at the end of April, start of May, because, as I haven't actually said on the podcast, but I'm going to be a father then, so me and my wife are expecting our first child, so whew, things are going to be wonderful and a little bit scary at the same time. Oh, and the other thing that I'm doing to try and spread the word in terms of the This Is Horror podcast to gain momentum is I am listening to all of your requests. If you tell me there's somebody you want us to interview, where possible, I'm going to do my best to fill that. You know, Orin Gray, Laird Barron, two people who a lot of our listeners have requested. So if you request someone the likelihood of them being on the show multiplies. And request whoever you want. I I will try my best. Now, admittedly, if you request Stephen King, that's going to be very difficult. I mean, don't request Stephen King, because 
if I can get him on the show, I will. So, no need, is there? But <laughs> you can request other people that you think, okay, that would be a very difficult person to get on, but I'd love to hear Bob and Michael talk to them, because we might be able to make it happen. I'll damn sure try. Now, this is the part of the show where I would hand off to the sponsors of the show. There is no sponsor. This episode is dedicated to Jack Ketchum. And what you need to do is you need to buy his books. You need to read his stories. And as I said at the start, I compiled an article for Lit Reactor on the wisdom of Jack Ketchum. And I'd like to share a couple of quotes from Jack Ketchum from that. So the first is his advice to new writers. Read everything, not just in genre. If you like a writer's lips, try making them your own. Start writing short stuff, not novels. Find a reasonable schedule to write in and stick to it. And then, as Robert Block once told me, if you don't have to write, don't do it. And also from Jack Ketchum, this is on newbie mistakes. So if you're starting out, if you're relatively new to writing fiction, this might be really helpful. Modifiers, too damn many adjectives and adverbs. You've got to keep that train running and its fuel is verb and noun. Too much description. Do I really need to know that his hat is worn at a rakish angle or that he's wearing a hat at all? If I don't, leave it out. Now when Dallas was asked if he had any famous last words, one final thing to say to the world, he said... Something in Greek, which I won't attempt to pronounce. But in English, the translation is go with the good. Go with the good. That's what I want to leave you with. So until next time, take care of yourself. Be good to one another. Read horror. Have a great day. And go with the good.